Hey guys, welcome to That Pedal Show. Dan here. Mick here, hello. So we're doing a split screen non-sadness again this week, Dan. That's right, I like that. Which, if you're not aware, is actually a John Mayer reference. Oh, okay. Yeah, not aware. Yeah, But I'm okay with that. <laughs> um, so if you didn't catch last week's show, Dan and I did this last week where uh, he's at his home in Swin Vegas and I'm in my home, also in Wiltshire, but a long way away. Uh, and uh, if I do this, I'm talking to Dan. If I do this, I'm talking to you and I'm trying to get it right. Okay. Where am I for you, Daniel? You're right next to the camera, so I can... Oh, nice. I'm just, you know, I've got the best of both worlds. All right, I guess we should start off with um, a fairly serious congratulations for Dan's vlog this week, which uh. was a feat of epic work. <laughs> uh, it was, it was. It was an incredible, self-indulgent, uh, epic journey, but so much fun and I just you know I thought I tell you what I'll do I'm going to do something that's like really really hard and I'm going to get some of the best guitar players in the world to do it with me as well you know just to give me a bit of a pep um but yeah man it was so great uh the response to it's been awesome as well it's been and, really great if you haven't watched yeah. it please watch it um it's on this channel it's Dan's vlog from Tuesday uh, where he takes two weeks of practice time but shares it with his daughter Liv. And I have to say, mate, however good any of the playing was and however awesome it was to have Adam Neely and Andy and Joey and Dougie and Jack all playing on the track, the best, best, best thing was seeing Liv's progress. Pretty amazing, isn't it? I'll tell you what amazed me is that when she started playing that pentatonic um, section and you were asking her to sing it I heard music I wasn't yeah. I wasn't hearing guitar notes yeah and it didn't sound like she was playing pentatonic stuff that we all know you know she was just just singing and expressing and it's like okay that that is why that's so important because if it's coming from here and when, when you sing that's what happens because it's so personal the voice is your most personal instrument and it's just the guitar, her, her guitar playing was being led by her voice. It was a conversation. Yeah, yeah. She was definitely. speaking, and that, and that, and there was a couple of times where she saw there was a bit of syncopation and a bit of exactly as you would in a sentence. And I was like, "Blimey, O'Reilly, that that is the kind of thing that some people take years working on, and she's just there doing it straight away." Yeah, I mean, to be fair, she's, you know, she's a she's a talented girl. She she won Swindon's Young Musician of the Year this year um, for her singing um, you know she's been she's you know been uh, training singing properly with with a singing school for years and years and years oh okay and she, so she's a proper singer so she understands music so she's already got some ground there she's got yeah yes but as, as far as singing is concerned and, and but she you know so she will um, you know she loves playing guitar she loves playing along to Joni Mitchell songs and stuff and she's you know, she uh, plays along with Jeff Buckley. You know, she she loves artists. She loves the art, the creative art of music. And so it felt like this is an extension of that for her. But she had never played a solo before. That was Amazing. it. She had two weeks and she was into that. Cool. Well, please watch that. It's uh, the last two videos in the, in the playlist if you look at our YouTube playlist. It was a great one, mate. And congrats on putting it all together because... Uh, video editing is not your first thing, is it? So <laughs> it's, not even, it's not even my my last thing. <laughs> nice one. Okay, on to today's show. Last week we did a kind of, uh, what was it, five things um, we wish we'd known when we were starting out. Mm -hmm. This week we're going to repeat that format, except this week it's five things we've learned from recording at home, which hopefully will be relevant to pretty much everybody out there who records at home. Um Dan and I chose two things each, uh, things that have kind of been light bulb moments for us, having been forced to record at home because of dear old COVID, of course. So um, shall we get into it, Dan? Yes, let's do it. These are the, hang on, I, I need to bring up the list on my telephonic device here. Um, number one, Dan, an ISO cab has been a game changer. Yeah, absolutely. This was a total revelation. Run VT. 
So a number of you have asked if I have bought a bar fridge for my little studio. Uh, no. This is my Grossman Audio Isolation Cab. So it's a speaker cab um, with this big heavy isolated lid on it that basically reduces the sound level by 30 dB. So I've dialed this sound up. I'm going through the big chopper from Audio Kitchen straight into the Grossman Audio Cab. Uh, it has a green back 25 watt Celestion in there and I've got a, a ribbon mic, the Delta II from Sontronics, and an SM57. So this is the sound I've got going through my monitors. Turn the monitors off. So let's get rid of a couple of misconceptions about ISO cabs. It reduces the sound pressure level immensely, like this reduces the volume by about 30 dB. However, it isn't silent. So if I crank the amp up really loud. <laughs> I mean, you can definitely hear that in the room. But the reality is, there's absolutely no way I could record at that level with the lid off. Now, the one thing that you don't get from an ISO cab is any sort of room ambience. And when I first had it back in the studio, it's something that I really noticed. Um, so Mick had sent me his recordings of just recording, you know, quite low volume in his house and like, straight out of the box, it, those things sound amazing. Um, However, adding a bit of ambience, you know, post-recording is really easy. Uh, and I think that's also why I'm preferring recording with an amp that has a built-in reverb as opposed to just a, you know, something flat. Now saying that, what I did notice was I was able to get a really great guitar sound with this in a minute. I mean, I didn't even muck around with mic placements, I just, just turned it up and it was there, it's like, okay, that's the sound of a mic on a speaker. And that, you know, that is the gold star. So it's not the sound of a mic on a speaker in a room, but it is the sound of a mic on the speaker. interesting thing I noticed about recording with an ISO box because I'd spent so much time um, you know working with uh, amps in the box and um, IRs and things the first thing I noticed was in comparison the sound is so direct and so immediate that it's actually more challenging to play like like it's like I think a lot of you will have noticed the first time you play through a really, really good amplifier that really amplifies everything, and you hear things in your playing that you might not have heard before. That's what happened with this. Uh, so when I recorded uh, the jam we did, you know, with with Mick and Andy and Joey, that was the first time I've recorded with the ISO cab, and man alive, because I could hear everything so clearly, it really made me try and tighten things up. Um, you know, this uh, it's just such a direct sounding feeling and the transients are so bang on.
So with the Grossman ISO cab, a couple of really great things about it. First of all, Stephen Grossman, uh, what a legend, it's such a lovely guy, proper, um, you know, German engineer, like the, it's built beautifully. So Stephen has owned uh, like large recording studios and things, and he really knows about standing waves, um, which is, you know, sort of the reverse of a resonant frequency inside the cabinet. And in, in lots of isolation cabinets, lots of people complain about there being a honkiness to it. And Stephen's gone to great lengths to get rid of that. So he's done a fantastic job of using a baffle to get rid of that standing wave. So what does that mean for the IRs that I've been using? Well, the reality is I haven't used IRs since I've got the ISO cab. Uh, I've found that I can plug in and just turn up and it just sounds fantastic, especially with that uh, the ribbon mic on there. And uh, I've got an SM57. I've got a couple of other microphones that I'm going to be trying out just to blend in. But the reality is I really don't need anything else with that um, that Delta II, the Sontronics Delta II ribbon mic. It just sounds magic. Like, so all I literally do is turn that up and it sounds great. However, it doesn't mean that I'm not going to use IRs anymore. So there's specific things like a, you know, a big 4x12 cabinet or a specific speaker, uh, you know, things that I can still mess around with for a specific guitar sound that, quite frankly, won't be possible, um, you know, recorded in this room with an ISO cab. You know, like a 4x12 has got a specific sound about it. However, for the majority of stuff that I'm going to do, I just find that the directness of this uh, recorded uh, really works for me. Cool. I tell you what, what I found most fascinating about that whole thing was the fact how quickly because I guess what anyone watching this won't necessarily be aware of are the text conversations and phone conversations and FaceTimes that Dan and I had when we were both pulling our hair out with IRs. And then the ISO cab turns up, I get one going, three minutes, done. Yeah, it was crazy. I didn't even, I mean, I, I don't have a great deal of uh, experience as far as mic placement and stuff is concerned. So... I just stuck mics on just to make sure it was working. I turned it up, just went, whoa. You know, and it was like, it was there. Yeah, just just wonderful. And, not, and that's not to say there's not a learning curve with this stuff. Yeah. Um, but for the majority of the stuff that I'm doing, the just getting that core tone, you know, once you've got that, you can manipulate it however you like but getting that fundamental tone is everything you know and so yeah it's just made life so much easier did you have any um did you stumble across anything with the blend of the two mics has that thrown up any interesting yeah things? yeah so so one thing i found is that if you record you can fix it in the door so when i say fix it what I really want to do is I'm trying to get the phase of the two mites exactly the same. But I found that you're a lot better off actually uh, experimenting with the mics in the cab and getting it to record in phase as opposed to lining it up post recording. Oh, wow. So were you finding that even the two mics in the ISO cab were not phased correctly? Uh, just And it's just the distance from the speaker because they're so close. And just, you know, if you only have to, one only has to be a millimetre out and it'll change the phase. Just the really? time lag. Yeah, but the time between the sound wave hitting one mic and the next one. That's amazing. Even at that distance. Even at that distance. Wow. So just spending the time to get that right. And so when it comes in, it is bang on. Yeah. You know. Um, what about the levels of the two mics? Uh, once you set the gain and again... Props to uh, UA, they just make it so easy. So uh, a really big thing is turning off the monitoring in Logic and monitoring through UA so that you don't get any latency. Um, and once you've got the 
the levels of the mic, just getting the getting the balance of them right was, was really simple. I found that if I mixed, so the ribbon mic is doing the majority of the heavy, heavy lifting. I would probably mix the uh, SM57 in between 20 and 30%, just because there's an upper mid thing that the SM57's got that's really fantastic. Um, and just a little bit of that, uh, just adds a little bit of hair and sizzle. Yeah. The the ribbon mic, uh, I mean, it's got top end, but it's you know it's warm and lush. It sounds produced. Yeah. The ribbon mic, it's like you turn it up, it's like I don't need anything else. It sounds like a produced guitar track. And that blew me away. You know um, what though? It's got a dead flat frequency response. Oh wow! Okay, yeah. wow. Yeah. 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 Um, hats off to Sontronic for that thing. I've just, I'm sort of overawed with it. Again, because I'm, you know, I'm quite new to all this recording at home, but I found that the getting that stuff right before it hits the, you know, that and doing as little post production on the guitar sound as possible, uh, it just kept everything, I don't know, just kept everything more together. Yeah. Um, yeah, wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. I'm, to, to be honest, I'm going to have to get another one. Because I'm going to have to do wet dry because I saw I saw yours, which we'll talk about now. Actually, no, let's let's see yours now. Okay. And, uh, well, um, the first part of the thing we're going to talk about is number two. Quiet amps mic'd is much better than IRs or direct for me anyway. Run VT. Okay then, as we've alluded, this is about using amplifiers with microphones. Um, and they don't need to be loud. I'm going to use the example of the uh, brilliant vlog that Dan did this week where he put together the backing track um, over those gospel changes and asked us all to play over it. And I recorded hit that here in this room, in this exact setting. Uh, I'm using Logic, not Luna. We'll get to Luna in a minute in the next thing. But um, for now, uh, I'm going to explain exactly how I did it um, and use the screen here to show you what happened thereafter, just to kind of prove that I thought that, you know, if I'm permitted to say this, it was a pretty decent guitar sound. I was really happy with it. Um, and it was super quiet in this room. How quiet? If we were using the dB meter like we have in the studio, it would be about probably 75, if that. So enough to be heard outside of the room, just about. But Catherine said she was down the end of the kitchen outside in the garden, she couldn't hear it. So it wasn't a big deal. Late at night, maybe, but certainly during the day for an hour or two, no biggie, which was a great revelation to me because as we'll discuss after this, the direct thing, IRs and stuff, just, I can't do it. I can't do it because I've spent 35 years, 30 years hearing the resonance of a guitar and a speaker and my body. And I've been doing that for so long now, I can't be without it. Furthermore, not contentiously, but pointedly, every guitar sound I have ever loved, ever truly loved, has been a microphone on a speaker. There are others I'm sure that I like that have been recorded direct, but all the stuff I love, microphone, speaker. What you'll notice on screen here is that there are three tracks. I'll make this one really small just to make it really obvious. That one I've just made small is the backing track. These two are the two guitars I recorded. Um, I recorded them um, out of my pedal board, which I'll show you now, into the two amps, ostensibly wet dry. Uh, I think one of them had a delay going to it and one didn't. Um, using two pedals, one was the Thorpey Warthog, and that was going into the Analog Man uh, OD9, so the Maxon OD9, modded OD9, which also has a built-in Bad Bob Booster, but I wasn't using that. Bad Bob Booster, Bad Bob Booster. So as you can see, we've got two guitar tracks, two amps. One was, I think, a Victory V140. The other was the uh, Mesa California Tweed. The Victory, this is the dry sound of the Victory. So this is what was recorded. I'll just turn that up a bit. Okay, that was with a Neumann TLM-102 on that amplifier. 
And as you can see, as, I, as it proves here in the channel strip settings, there's nothing. I've done no EQ, nothing to that, to that sound. That is exactly how it is recorded. Um, if we just do that with the Mesa for a second, uh, I'm just going to turn these things off. There is some stuff on here. A little bit more aggressive in the bite, which you'd expect from a tweed style amp. And uh, there's quite a lot of bass in there, actually. I don't know if Dan EQ some of that bass out, but if we hear them both together, uh, you get this. So what's kind of interesting about that is um, it just fattens and widens the sound. As you can see, I've got them panned here just a tiny bit. Uh, that's exactly what we do in the in the TPS studio when we record two amps, just pan them ever so slightly left and right. If I pan them completely left and right, this is what you get. And you can play with stereo imaging all day. It's really, really good fun. So there's a delay on something there. I can't remember which it's on. Maybe it's, uh, maybe it is on. No, so I think the victory is the wet amp. So the jam pedals delay llama extreme is running only on the, uh, the victory amp. So if you if I just put the backing track in for a sec. That's only the victory. That's only the Mesa, quite nasally and mid-range. It's both of them. Oh, that's some harmonic trim at the end. Get rid of that. So I'm pretty happy with that sound, to be honest. I sat here in the room, um, you've seen, you can see it on the screen, and uh, it's loud enough for me to hear. I've, I think, I don't know if I was wearing these headphones or maybe my um, IEMs, which have, have more, more uh, rejection in terms of outside noise, but the video will tell the story. Um, yeah, pretty happy. So what I did then was I added some stuff to the Mesa. I think for reasons I don't know, I decided it needed some EQ and I use this EQ, the uh, UAD API 560, which is a sound all of its own. Um, and it went from this. So it looks like I just took off a bit of that zingy high end, which actually wouldn't have been a bad thing in the mix. I obviously did it in a hurry. And I took out just some um, bloat here, 125, 250, um, which is a kind of a bloaty, boxy, standing wavy room type frequency that can be really painful, I find, on guitars and makes it bloat in a mix. But Dan may have tweaked it after that, but I, I felt that that was necessary. I'm not entirely sure why. It's pretty subtle. The weird phasey thing you're hearing there is when you turn the plugins on and off, the software corrects the latency. So it goes out of phase because the latency comes into effect and then it all corrects it all. 
So anyway. Um, and then finally, what I also did to the Mesa was I added extra reverb because hopefully one of the things that Dan's going to talk about, and if he doesn't, I'll, I'll say it here, it can always be wetter in the mix. Always, always, always for the kind of guitar sounds I use anyway, which tend to be quite dry, not exactly ambient, spacey kind of sounds. You can always add more reverb and delay. Sorry, it's doing that phasey thing again. What it does, it just sh shuts it back a little bit out of the way so it's not quite so in your face. I just chose to do it on one side. Um, arbitrary decision. In addition, on the, um, let's turn it back on. I've got a bus going on here. Dan's gonna talk about what buses are a bit more in one of his sections. I use two plugins. I use the UAD Ocean Way Studios Room Reverb, which is just an absolutely glorious plugin. And also the UAD Teletronics LA2A, which is a leveling amplifier. Um, so here's the sound with those things off. So you hear just a bit of room reverb. Um, pretty subtle, but again, it just pushes it back into that mix and gives it a bit of space to live. And then the Teletronics usually just adds a bit of sizzle up top and a little bit of punch down the bottom to make it sound a bit more finished. just a bit more of the old Ocean Way Studios. There's two more microphones here, as you can see. I've got just the mid one. I'll add the two other room mics as well. point of showing you that is just with the close amp, close mics on the amps themselves, um, I've added a room reverb plugin, which gives it the sound of space in a room. Now, I hope what that demonstrates is that, you know, and goodness, I hope this doesn't come off as defensive, but I quite often get uh, accused of being a technophobe. So what I hope this demonstrates to you is my willingness to use digital plugins for post-production and all this computing gear to do all of this hopefully demonstrates that I'm not a technophobe. Um, what stops me from using IRs and direct signals with guitars is because it destroys the connection your body has with a resonating guitar and speaker. And actually on that point, I'll just end this little bit by saying, the reason I use the 335 is because it resonates a bit more against my body. What I've been really finding, and maybe this is a bit of discussion for me and Dan, Strat, I really struggle to make work in this environment because it's a less resonant guitar. It has less air in it. It's not moving as much because I'm playing quietly. Whereas loud, 
Strat's pretty much the only guitar I want to play. So I think maybe that's something else I've learned as a sort of bonus thing is the guitars that you maybe are most comfortable with in your normal environment might not be entirely right in the other environment. So if you're used to recording at home with a particular guitar, it might not work live and vice versa. Not necessarily from a sound point of view, which is you, what you would think it's all about, but more from a connection with the instrument point of view. Um, so there we go. I've probably gone on too much about that, but um, yeah, small amps, mic'd at home, really quietly, sensitive mics. Uh, just mention again that it was a Neumann TLM-102 on the Victory. It was a Sontronics Delta II ribbon mic on the Mesa, and they were going straight into a couple of preamp channels uh, in my interface. So they're actually models of Neve preamp channels, so pretty nice stuff, but digital nonetheless, um, just to bring the gain up and make them nice and loud. What do you think of that, Dan? So when you sent me your track, and I opened it up, and I, I mean, I literally did nothing to it. I just popped it in there, and it just sounds epic. <laughs> I was so blown away. Um, and then when you said that you were you had the both amps. I'm like, oh, of course. Uh, he's got the two amps going. He's got a, a wet dry thing. It, I, I, it's it's hard to put into words. It has presence and depth. Uh, you can hear the guitar, you know. So I'm going to have to get another isolation cab because I, I've got to go. I've got to go record wet dry now. Well, I just you know it. it there may be a couple of contentious points for people there when we, Dan and I have both not had any luck with IRs and, you know, let's get it said that there are people out there who use IRs very successfully and get great guitar sounds and it ends up sounding really good. But A, here's how, here's what I think, Dan. It's a lot of work. Mm. There's a lot of corrective EQ that goes on. Right. And I think outside of modern prog and metal, which again, potentially contentious point, a lot of that music is made in a very constructed way right. using a lot of digital technology, certainly the latest stuff. So it is a, it is a child of the technology. Sure. The stuff Look, when you listen, when you, when you hear Nolly's stuff, um, so, uh, you know, on Facebook, you see ads yeah. for, the, for his stuff and it does sound absolutely incredible. Sounds and great it, in that genre. Yeah, absolutely. It's perfect for that. Yeah. And even well, Rabir was saying that with the, with the, the heavier side of things, the way that they can sculpt that EQ to be to fit in exactly the spot they want is brilliant. But what I always struggle with was the the, the cleaner sort of little bit gritty sounds because yeah. those, I mean, the the transience in that stuff is everything, and just getting that the really sharp edge of that waveform and that and that slightly gritty thing is yeah, absolutely everything. Um, and I think that's what I was struggling with. Also, and I, this is probably more user error than anything, but whether it was whether it was the latency that I was experiencing, it was just this sense of disconnect, yeah. and I was I really really struggled with that. Well, the um, disconnect the disconnection is everything for me, and that's that yeah. goes across the two things that I'm talking about in this video, and even just having the amps very quiet in the room gave me enough connection to feel it yeah um certainly you know through the guitar and everything the other thing was i had to stand up i couldn't sit down right just i i did so many takes sat down and i thought hang on a minute, i'm really uncomfortable here i stood up and i think that was the second take wow stood up after about 40 sat down <laughs> i mean to be fair i would practiced it 40 times <laughs> by then but <laughs> no it's great seeing see, seeing nearly headless mick on the screen yeah. And uh, yeah, that was, yeah. No but I think that, that that should tee into what what we'll discuss at the end, which is, you know, headspace is, is really everything. And Yeah. And again, I mean, I did say in the, in, you know, the part I'm talking about the isolation cab, I will still use IRs for specific things. Like yeah. I, if I wanted uh, like a, an extremely heavy section just for a texture, I'm not going to get that here with the isolation cab you know well i certainly mean i probably could but it'd be, that's not in my wheelhouse you know 
but I know that sound is exists there and it's really easy to dial up, you know, or the sound of a of a four by twelve. So something really specific like that for little textures. So in in the vlog that I did about recording guitars at home, most of the stuff that I recorded with IRs I'm keeping, like the harmony guitars and that sort of stuff, I'm keeping. But the the sound of the riff is now all done. That was the, that was the sound, just that main texture sound that I was really struggling with. Um, and I think, and it was just that, yeah, that as you say, that disconnect. Because if you're experiencing that, there's no EQ, no nothing sorts that out. You just don't get the performance, do you? Yeah, exactly, exactly. And also, what you were saying about the 335, about especially at lower volume, you felt that resonating more. Um, I found that fascinating. Yeah, I hadn't, it hadn't struck me until I tried to do a couple of things with the Strat and it was like, okay, I'm just, I'm so used to being able to feel everything because yeah. we normally play really loud. And then, so you solve one problem uh, by it being nice and loud and you being able to feel it and that's all great. And then you create another problem, which is that's actually really hard to record. What yeah, I found about right. being here at home with... You know, okay, so I've called them small amps, but they're not small amps. It's a Mesa California Tweed, which is really loud, and a Victory V140. Um, what I actually meant was quiet amps, because yeah. um, they turn right down to kind of nothing. And and I found that way easier to record and got a, what I thought was a really decent result, um, even quiet, quiet at home. So awesome. Yeah, happy days. Okay, so... So I think this ties in really nicely, talking about uh, adding a bus par uh, parallel reverb. So even though I haven't been using uh, a door for very long, this little trick helped me out immensely. Okay, so remember I was talking about the isolation cab, even though it's a great guitar sound, it doesn't have a sense of space, okay? It's just the sound of the mic on the speaker. So pedal board into the amp, amp into the isolation cab. There's two mics, there's an SM57, and a Delta II ribbon, and that is going straight to the Apollo Twin. So this is the sound of the guitar, no reverb, straight into Logic. Now the great thing about that sound, you can, I mean, it's mics on speaker, it sounds great. Now this is the sound of Dougie's drums, okay, no added reverb. So what I'm going to do now is add a reverb, but put it in a bus. So instead of adding the reverb directly onto the track, I'm going to set it up separately, and I'm going to send a parallel signal from the guitar to the bus. Now there are some amazing reverb plugins, um, but what I'm going to do here is just to give you that sense of space, I'm going to use one called Oceanway Studios. It's basically the sound of recording in Oceanway Studios, which is pretty epic. Um, there's there's another one, uh, the Capital Chambers, the the, the uh, reverb chamber in Capital Studios as well. Another great um, reverb plugin. But this is Oceanway Studios. Now, because we've got it set up on a bus, what I can do is send the signal in parallel from the guitar and the drums to the same reverb. So this is the sound of the guitar and drums together with no reverb. And here's the sound of the guitar and drums both being sent in parallel to Oceanway Studios. Now what I love about this is you get the sense that both the drums and the guitars are existing in the same space. Okay, it's such a, it's such a great way to sort of add that depth. Now with uh, an isolation cab, doing something like this is essential to give you that sort of sense of depth. However, even if you're using IRs or a, you know, a, a, a plug-in, you know, the, um, the amp simulators that exist in, in Logic, you have reverb options in there okay to add you know halls and things but try turning those off and sticking a separate reverb on a bus and sending a bunch of things to it and you just get the sense that they all exist in that same space it's really really cool
So for me, this goes beyond like a, a an even tied reverb plugin or something like that. Um, you know, they're awesome, but this it's, it is the sound of being in that room, and that the that, that you can send as many things there as you like, and just to give that sense of togetherness is really cool. Right, short and sweet, but I think uh, you get the point. Yeah, I the the response to this will be very interesting because to some of you watching this, you won't believe we've done something so simple. Mm. To many others of you watching this, you'll be like, wow, that is rocket science. Sure. And that to me is what this kind of digital technology does to people. It sort of polarizes them. Once you know, you know, and you're in this, hey, I know club. But if you don't know, having any clue whatsoever where to get started is borderline impossible, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so what I found, especially with the, the ISO cab, because, you know, I had this, I've got the sound, the core sound is there and I'm connected and I'm like, yep, this is it. Right. Done. But like, even when you recorded your amps quietly, you, there's still a sense of space. You know what yeah. I mean? There's still a sense of a room. Yeah. But with the ISO cab, there's nothing. Uh, yeah, but it's this, finished. exactly. But this is what, uh, you know, it's, you know, the UA plugins and all, you know, you know, all the plugins. This is what the digital thing is awesome at, is giving, uh, being able to add reverb and, and uh, the sense of space. So as soon as that gets stuck in, you know, the Ocean Way or Capital Chambers or something, suddenly it's like, You've got your core tone, and but you can hear it in that space. And then, you know, putting drums and whatever else in there, it just gives that sense of cohesion, which sort of blew my mind when when I when you first showed me how to do that. Yeah. Blew my mind. It was and of course, wonderful. the advantage of doing it on a bus rather than within the track itself, because if you've got something like a plug-in reverb, you can either apply it to just that track. Again, apologies to anyone for whom this is oversimplistic, but for, if you've never done this, it won't be oversimplistic. It will be useful information. You can either apply that plug-in to the single track, i.e. a guitar track, or you can set it up on a separate bus and send it off, and then you can send all your instruments to it if you want at dif differing levels. Parallel mixing, been done in studios since the dawn of studios, so... Uh, but until you do it and until you actually open up something and and do it and I think there's also I don't know if you agree with this Dan they're a bit like how some people think effects pedals are cheating okay. I think I think sometimes there can be a feeling among uh, people recording stuff that adding plugins and you know messing about like that is somehow cheating because it's not the sound but I couldn't disagree more with that I think you know, it's all about getting it to sound good by whatever means necessary. Sure. Well, I guess in that uh, scenario, get it, having a really nice guitar would be cheating. You know, it's just all, you know what I mean? It's, it's just, it's their, their tools and, and whatever gets you the results, you know. Like for me, uh, and, and, you know, I'm, I'm sure you'll agree with this, Unless, it doesn't matter what the tools are to get that, to, for you to be connected to get the performance, all right? Once you've, man, my stomach is going nuts today. Right. Maybe lunchtime, mate. So, but once you've got that performance, then it's got to sit in the track, right? Then you become, a, you know, sort of different headspace. It's got to, you know, work in the track. Yeah. And nothing has ever clicked a light bulb off for me to like this trick. And I think that that ties into the whole performance versus sound. Obviously, the ideal situation is great performance and great sound. But I think it was Fraser that first said it to me directly, but of course it's been said by engineers and producers, musicians, artists, writers down the, down the ages. Mm. Take a great performance over a great sound any day of the week. Yeah, right. Because a great sound without a great performance is nothing. A great performance with an okay sound is still moving. Sure. Awesome. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe we'll talk about that a bit at the end as well. All right, then. So, number four. They're all pretty closely linked today because they're all 
largely based around me and Dan getting our head around using doors and doing all this stuff. Not exactly for the first time, but maybe re-learning uh, a bunch of stuff that we haven't done for a while. Um, so number four is a continuation of where I started earlier. Oh yeah, number four, it's totally okay to use plenty of pre and post effects. Okay, for my second thing, I wanna talk a little bit about pre and post effects. Dan was also gonna to touch on a little bit of this, I think, talking about buses. Um, not the kind, anyway, no, that's, that's a really bad joke. I'm gonna record a bit of my track. My track fell to pieces I stopped doing the vlog because I was so apoplectically annoyed at the rubbish guitar sounds I was getting going direct. And uh, I would nearly junk the whole thing. I was so annoyed by it. And interestingly, um, I went into a bit of a down after that. I had a pretty down week. First one I've had in uh, over a year. And I'm not saying it was that, but I think it does seem to be linked with poor performance in music that definitely is a trigger for me. A whole load of psychoanalysis there if you want to do it. I just put the track down because I was going to bin the whole thing. Uh, I was just so annoyed. And the following week, I went back to just miking amps here in the room and got great sounds with my amps. So I feel a little bit more comfortable about coming back to the track. So I'm actually going to talk a little bit about pre and post effects. I'm going to put a guitar part down, which has a tremolo and overdrive and a delay on it in pre. So that's what's going to get recorded to the uh, actual track and then I'm going to add some stuff in post um, as well just to make the point that there are a lot of people who think that you shouldn't record any wet effects in the mix at all and they should all be added post because it gives you the most um, latitude in terms of mixing and production. I say I'm not Bob Rock or uh, any other fantastic producer out there. I just want to do it in a way that where the guitar sound inspires me and commit to tape a little bit. I don't mind doing that tape I wish. Josh Smith's got an awesome Studer A800. In fact he's got two and he's robbing bits off one to fix the other one. Oh man to have a tape machine and someone to operate it. Anyway um, the next time I'll change that I'll need to move the camera because I'm going to be playing the guitar but before we do that here's the track in its current form. Um, you will hear what will you hear bass and drums I think maybe. Uh... Somewhere in there was the scratch guitar part I put down it, um, originally just so I could play the bass along too. Super wet, uh, not very nice, but a scratch guitar part. This was the first thing I did with Ox through the SP diff, and it has something in there that I really don't like. Oh, Just sounds really plicky and like I'm gonna have to do a corrective EQ on it, which you definitely can do. You could definitely fix that. But what I found was the sound in my ears was making me so unhappy. The performance was rubbish. Um, Fraser will tell you that uh, he would have a good performance and a rubbish sound over a fantastic sound and a rubbish performance any day of the week, and so would I. Um, and here's somebody said there might might have been a problem with the SP diff settings, so I tried it into the line ins. I guarantee there are people out there who will say, wow, that's a fantastic guitar sound, I love it. I hear a uh, and a uh, and a uh, in there that I just don't want to hear that I'm gonna to have to EQ out and change. So I just don't want it. I'm gonna junk them, they're going away. I never want to hear them again. Um, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna put down the other guitar part, which is the uh, which is the tremoloed bit on the Collings. So the next time you see me, I'll be doing that. Okay, I think we're in the game. Uh, I'm down here, I'm having to walk around. The voice mic froze up there, so it might sound a bit weird. I've set up this sound using the uh, Mesa California Tweed and a Fender Blues Junior. <laughs> Yeah. 
Yeah, baby. Let's go for a take. Uh, how do we do this? Let's try this. Hopefully it's loud enough in my ears. I really hope it is. Okay, uh, I played the wrong part, we're going to talk about that later. I think I know what I'm going to play now, let's try that again. Okay, there's a mistake in, here, in there, but I don't want to keep doing this all night, so we'll keep that one for the purposes of demonstration. Okay, then let's see what we got, shall we? Um, I didn't spend very long setting the guitar sound up, I just plugged it in, I'll show you the settings on the amps in a second. Turn the Analog Man Tube Screamer on, set a delay time and a tremolo at random, so they're not in time with the track, they are just as they are. They are as God made them, sir. Um, so let's have a listen to what we recorded. It should be funny. <laughs> I tell you what, rather than what I've learned, it's what I'm learning, present tense. <laughs> So with the tremolo on it, that's the Mesa, um, the tremolo and the reverb, I believe. Uh, tremolo and delay, sorry. And if we hear that in the context of the track, let's see how that tremolo is sitting with the track. <laughs> Sounds awesome. Let's add the Blues Junior. So without any EQ, without anything at all, it's sounding a little bit nasal to me. Um, I'm going to just try something. I'm going to try and pan the tremolo guitar over to one side and see what that does.
what panning does is it makes the makes the instrument much more prominent. I mean, you do have to be careful when you come to um, master and stuff because uh, um, stereo effects can be weird on radio, and you need to check the mono mix as well. But for the purposes of this discussion, I've got the tremolo guitar all the way out on the left. Let's put the um, the dry guitar on the right, and I'm going to add a ton of reverb to it. Okay, that's probably taken long enough in the context of this vlog. So what I've shown you there is using effects pre, um, i.e. from your pedal board and recording them to tape as it were, and then adding some in post and using panning um, to really separate those two guitars out. What I hope that demonstrates, and maybe we can talk about this, Dan, is when we talk about wet dry rigs all the time, and that's the kind of thing we use live, you might think that you would never use that for recording. I've just used it here, and I think it gives us loads of options in post. It certainly means that I don't need to double track it, uh, which, I don't know, is a stylistic decision. Maybe you'd want to do that as well. But um, yeah, so that's what I've learned. Small amps at home, really quiet in here. It's not loud at all. Uh, can actually sound really big when you use a mix of pre and post effects and a bit of creative panning. Um, this is inspiring me to get this track up and running again. Man, the wet dry thing every time still blows my mind. And the panning thing was amazing. Yeah, I wanted to do, I wanted to do that specifically. So let's say for the record that uh, Dan and my definition of wet dry isn't necessarily everyone's definition of wet dry. In this case, actually, there's reverb everywhere. So it's neither wet dry. It's probably dual mono at best. Just get that said. Um, but yeah, so it's exactly the same as the the thing I did before, except I've swapped out the victory for a Blues Junior. And I did this on purpose because Blues Junior is, you know, absolutely ubiquitous amp that so many hundreds of thousands, tens of thousands, probably tens of thousands of people own across the world. And uh, I thought it sounded amazing mixed with the with the Mesa. Wonderful. Yeah. So the the, the panning thing then, um, what's always struck me about pan guitars is if they're straight down the middle, you obviously you hear them, but if you stick them in one speaker, it's like, oh, here I am. Yeah, yeah, right. Do you ever do that with separate mics? Uh, if you've got two mics on a cabinet, do you ever pan the mics? I think that would work. And then I think an old trick, Rick Beato honk, talks about this or has talked about it. Um, Hang on, can you honk Rick Beato? Uh, oh no, I can't honk Rick Beato. Ah, oh, I was gonna say. Yeah, sorry, I've I've inappropriately honked Rick <laughs> Beato there. The honk for for those of you who don't know means that we've met the person or we know them, and uh, I haven't met Rick Beato, so sorry. Uh, retract the honk <laughs> uh, for Rick Beato. He's certainly honk worthy, day, but yeah. we haven't met him. Um, I hope to shake his hand. I hope the Pacific is as blue as it is in my dreams. Yes, I I, I do hope to meet the man. So he talks about it on old tracks where I don't know if they did it with two microphones or how they did it, but you get the sort of direct guitar in one speaker and then you just get a ton of reverb in the other. So it's kind of, it's mixed in that way. And that's what I tried to do again here. I think I added a load of reverb to the, to the, to the, Blues Junior actually, okay, and, and pan that all over to one side. So it's an alter maybe it's an alternative to double tracking, as I mentioned in the vid. Okay, ah, oh, mate, what a killer sound! the The funny thing is, as soon as I heard that, I could I could see 
or feel the enthusiasm for the song coming back. Because it just, honestly, it sounded like it, it was moving. And it's like, and that sort of, that came across. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. And I definitely felt like that after I'd done it. And it was literally, I did it for the purposes of this video. So it was all set up really quickly. I, as I said in the, in the VT, I did not set the speed of the tremolo or the delay at all. They are totally arbitrary speeds. So they're not time synced to the track, um, which I don't think matters. It might, it might drive some people crazy, but it seems to work. It's wonderful. For me anyway. So I'm going to do a whole one of those and try and get a really good takedown. Also, what I tried, to, what I want to do with that guitar part is play the whole part all the way through the song. So you notice I'm turning the guitar down and up. So yes, there'll be some post mixing required, but actually the part is pretty much the part. Yeah, yeah. And then I like it, that. As you turn the guitar volume down, the overdrive drops off a bit, and and to me, those sorts of things is what makes it start feeling like a bunch of people in a room. Mm. rather than super precision I mean that you might want that super precision thing but I don't I want the feeling of some people hopefully doing human things but. very nice that was great mate One, wonderful stuff cool um, okay which leads us to our last point which is doesn't have a practical uh, video to go with it it's really a discussion about trying to separate the tech from the playing Mm. and the practice from the performance. Did you find this? Ah, oh, every day, man alive. Um, so one thing that I've struggled with, and I've mentioned before, and I, I, know, I know why I struggle with this is because I'm still wrapping my head around the technology, but because I'm so uncomfortable, well, not uncomfortable, because I'm still learning, I'm still in that area of, of recording where it's not instinctive and separating from my playing performing self to recording making sure that everything's set up I really really struggle um, but I've got to get better at it because you know I'm not hiring a full-time producer to live in my little box room anytime soon so you know but I can see <laughs> I can I can see uh you know, even just the, the, what, the work I've done now, it's starting to fall into place a little bit better. I'm starting to get my flow, my workflow a little bit, you know, a little, you know, down pat a bit more. It is. It's impossible, isn't it? When you're, when you're going, oh, I can't remember how to set the plug-in strip or, oh, blimey, where's the, as simple as, where's the record button again? Yeah. And it just pulls you out of that performance mindset yeah, I definitely found that with um, the thing with your track and with, I did something for Toman and also something for Victory. I got to a point where I think by the time, I think the Victory thing was the last thing I did. And the, the first thing I did was the Toman thing. That was much more straightforward and much more fluid. So it, it didn't take too many takes. Your thing probably took, I don't know, 45 takes, maybe 40 takes, something like that. And each, there'd be a bit of it that was absolutely perfect. And then there'd be one bit, just one tiny, tiny, tiny bit I would screw up on or drop the bend or the bend wasn't quite there or whatever. And I think by the, by the time I got to the one that was used, I was like, I'm actually going downhill now. Yeah, yeah. And so there's, there's bits of this that have lost kind of the fire of some of the earlier ones, but at least it's, I mean, there's still a mistake in it, but I'm like, I've got to, now is the time to stop because yeah, sure. I can't do another week on this. When I was practicing, so I'd get up really early and I'd start practicing, so between six and seven, but by seven o'clock, I got to a point, my hand just went, no. I was like, come on, and he said, no, I'm not doing this anymore. Leave me alone. You know, um, and, and, you know, the right hand just wouldn't pick. So like, okay, I got to put this down, you know, because that's uh, playing a, tr a tune like that with the changes just so ridiculously fast. It's a cerebral thing as much as anything. Trying to keep on top of that is really hard, but the physical act of trying to get all that together, it's it really does wear on your hands. Yeah, so you you've got a bunch of things going on there, haven't you? The middleman has stepped in. We've yeah. talked about the middleman before. 
The middleman being the barrier between your desire to do something and it actually happening, because the middleman stood there going, um, you know, with a clipboard, checking things off as you do them. And once once you have to go through the middleman, everything's off. Um, so the middleman steps in. You get the the um, physical fatigue to go with it as well. And you've got, I think, awesome. n- knowing when to stop and go, yeah, I need to put this down. Because I'm, I'm not, I'm not making any progress now. Yeah, I just yeah. put it down, go away from it, and you come back with renewed enthusiasm. And certainly by the time I got to the thing I did for victory, um, which isn't wasn't as complex, but it was still some pretty tricky playing, and a um, couple of little licks and stuff in there. I think I went through it and I jammed over it a lot, jammed over it a huge amount. Plus, it was in the studio at, at TPS, mm. so everything was familiar. Yeah, that's nice. I had a cup of coffee. I went in and I did two. Bang. And the second one was the one. Wow. And it's like, because I'd, the middleman, I told the middleman to leave. Mm. You're not wanted here, mate. (laughs) And just channeled the thing that I wanted to play and and wasn't thinking about the tech or anything like that. So I don't know how you do that in a home environment. I'm still struggling with it really hard to try and get your tech stuff sorted to the point where you're completely happy with it and it's it's almost muscle memory by that point yeah and that's what it needs to be that's uh you know i I, i've come to understand the longer i spend time with this tech and the more instinctive that it becomes the less i need to worry about being pulled out of that headspace and you know it's really interesting you can see why so, you know, again, another Ed O'Brien story, but talking to uh, Adam, his tech. And, you know, when, when they're on the road, you can imagine a, a band that's so creative and artistic. It's performance at that moment is everything. And Andy's, well, I've, uh, Andy's was saying that, um, you know, he Ed needs to walk on stage with absolute confidence and not worry about anything. And that's why his job is so important, because if he is worried about stuff, then the performance doesn't happen. Yeah. And you can, you know, we've and we've had experience of what happens when the performance happens, and it's really moving, yeah. you know. Um, and that's, you know, if you're in a situation where you've got a really great tech that can do that, you can see their value at that moment. But you know, for ninety nine point nine percent of us, that's not reality. So you know, in that sense, it's about the system's becoming second nature. Well, I think that brings us back to the top of the video. You know, the reason that Dan and I have, have returned, had a brief excursion into IRs and direct and have returned to mics on speakers. Ultimately, ultimately, is it because it's a better sound? I mean, hand on heart, I happen to think it is, but it's <laughs> that is just one person's opinion among the whole planet of guitar players and you'll find just as many people who don't think it is as think it is so it's it, that's for the birds what's more important than what you think is better or worse than is what drags the performance out of you and what you're comfortable doing so you can do everything we've just talked about and yeah. a work quickly and efficiently that's really important b have some connection to this thing that you're trying to do music and actually get some joy out of it. Because, you know, what I said in the VT was right. I was so unhappy with everything that was going on. Of course. It just put me in a foul mood. And I don't want to be in a foul mood. Yeah. I want I want things to be quick and easy and sound good. And just to be happy doesn't matter to anyone else in the world. <laughs> except you who is doing, you know, trying to make this music. The thing is, though, if you're in that world as we are, then this it's a really big deal to you, you know? And if it isn't right, it affects everything. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. That's great, mate. Really good. All right. Um, I think that's us then, isn't it? I think that's us. Uh, hopefully, Dan and I will be back in the same room together before too much longer. We are being deliberately cautious, uh, just watching that our rate um, and just treading carefully and hopefully everything can just smoothly get back into recording again in the studio before too much longer. I cannot wait. No, nor me. Yeah. This is hard work. <laughs> yeah, oh man. Yes, uh, but 
Till then, guys, thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Massive thank you to everyone that's gone to thatpedalshowstore.com and grabbed merch, T-shirt, DNM drives, uh, strings, all the stuff. Uh, it's made a real difference uh, during this period. So thank you guys so much. It's been great. Um, and also, a massive shout out to our patrons on Patreon. Yeah, thank you very um, much. Yeah, you guys are the best. Thank you so much. Uh, yes. And I miss you, buddy. And and Catherine and uh, Simon and Fraser, can't wait to get back. Yeah, it'd be soon enough. Simon and I have actually started recording um, some stuff. We're doing the social distancing thing. So the video you'll see next Friday, hopefully, if we get it done in time, will be me and Simon working together again. So we're just going to step it. Once we, oh, cool. once we think that's safe, we'll ask Dan back in and then we'll ask Fraser back in once, we, once we're all kind of confident that everything's going to go well. But yeah. better to take it slowly and steadily than just all jump back in and be in a place we don't want to be. Yeah. Oh, and also shout out to our preferred retailers. Yep. Uh, in the UK and Europe is? Uh, Andersons of Guildford in Surrey. Good to see Lee and Pete doing this kind of thing too. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's awesome. Uh, and our mates in Australia? Uh, Pedal Empire, Brisbane, Queensland. Hello, Matt and the gang. And uh, shout out to the guys at Sweetwater who are doing links to, that you'll see in the description. Yeah, links in the description below for the gear we use in these videos. Brilliant. Thank you for watching, guys. Um, take care. Lots of love and we'll see you soon. Cheerio. Bye. Bye. Bye.